with God's Truth Today. You're listening to WGTT 91.5 FM, serving Emeralda, Florida. Welcome to the North Lake Seventh day Adventist Church. Good morning. I'm sure glad that you church members are still coming in live stream. And you know, as I've talked with different members of the church over the telephone, I find you've still been reaching out, even though you aren't right here in the sanctuary. So at the same time, I'm just glad that uh, you're a part of the worship service this morning. As I understand it, the governor is beginning to uh, give a little relaxation of the restrictions. And I understand maybe Monday he's doing a little more restrictions where maybe some restaurants are going to be able to have 25% capacity. I know that some of the uh, state parks are beginning to be opened up for church members to be able to go to and and people is a part of keeping the distancing at the same time uh, we're able to begin to come back to life I know that being locked up for over 50 days has been pretty hard and uh, so on but guess what on Tuesday of this week I got a communication from the hospital. You got to come in and you got to do a test to find out whether you have COVID-19 or not. Oh boy, I didn't know what I was going to go in for. But they said you could show up without eating uh, a matter of 6.30 to 11 o'clock at night. And so in that time, all of us got to go to a little tent out behind the hospital, behind the emergency room, where they had been sending patients that had a high temperature or something like that, they would send them back there and check them out to see whether or not they could allow them to uh, be taken into the hospital. So, at the same time, I went in, guess what? I, they didn't stick my finger and they didn't do a a blood draw or those things, but they did a spit test. They tried to figure out whether I was worth spit or not. Well, I'll tell you what, the spit test wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. It took, you know, you had to take a little uh, test tube and uh, you had to fill it up with no bubbles to just about five, a line drawn at five on the scale there. And if you could do that, they took your uh, saliva and then they checked it and sent you a cell phone response or a computer response telling you, guess what, I'm clear. And I've been working in the hospital all this time. I was so glad to get that word because I was a little worried. I mean, you know, and this uh, last week, I got a call. I didn't expect the call. We had been trained as to how to help a patient who is dying from COVID-19. And in that training, we got equipment, a computer, and the nurse would have a computer. And that computer that the nurse had, they would take into the room. But if the family wasn't there, the family could talk with the chaplain and the chaplain would get his equipment and with that computer, I could reach out to one of the family members that was up in Portland, Maine. I could reach another one who happened to be uh, on the West Coast. And the rest of the family that was able to be present was able to be right there in the chapel with the chaplain. And they could go and we spent quite a bit of time dealing with the uh powers that be and guess what uh as a result uh the word came that things could work out and so it was just really encouraging for me to be able to work with the family from 
2 o'clock in the afternoon until their father passed away late that night. And yet they were able to be present with him during this dying process. It was the only case that I've dealt with, and I know that some of the other chaplains had dealt with one, but it's a little new and a little complicated. Uh, anyway, uh, now, let me, I'm going to have to read this communication I just received, but I want to open the worship service, and I'll come back on this other announcement a little bit later. The call to worship this morning is, I praise you, Lord, in public forum. I will sing about you among the nations. I, your compassion and kindness is as big as the sky. Your faithfulness is as broad as the heavens. May you be exalted above the heavens, our Lord, and may your glory fill the entire earth. Let us worship. Our Heavenly Father, indeed, how thankful and grateful we are for another beautiful, beautiful Sabbath day that you have blessed us with. Father, we're thankful for the many blessings that you have given to us. Father, we have come to praise and to give you thanks. We pray that you will honor our worship by your divine presence wherever, wherever we are. We pray that the Holy Spirit will rest upon us, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. The communication I received was to let you know that the prayer team was to be thanked. Julie wanted everybody to know, and uh, the entire prayer team has done a lot in staying close to members of the church, but not only that, Julie felt that the prayer team had gone with her through her loss of Bill Huggins who is a leader in our church. All right. Now, a scripture and prayer. Scripture is taken from Luke chapter 12, reading verses 16 to 21. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? since I have no room to store my crops. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my, my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then who will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, you know better than we can tell you we're saying that troublesome times are here, filling our hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear now is at stake. But we're thankful that we can say the Lord's our rock, in him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever may be tied, the shelter in the time of storm. O oh, Heavenly Father, be thou near to us in times like these. We need a Savior. In times like these, we need a Lord. Be thou for us our shelter in these times of storm. And be thou the rock of ages in whom we can find shelter. We've come 
with burdens on our hearts, complex issues, questions unanswered. But we have a God in whom we can trust, the all-knowing, the ever-loving, the ever-living, the almighty God is our strength, is our anchor. And we're asking you to please keep us near to you in faith and in our practical living so that whatever our state we will still be living witnesses for you and you will be pleased with us. We have many challenges and issues in times like these but you are never far from us. We pray that your abiding presence will keep us anchored steadfast no matter what the challenges are for you are a very present help in times of trouble so hear us this day bless us individually bless us collectively we remember those who've lost loved ones and we ask for your divine presence to comfort and console those who are distressed. We pray for those who are careless and are just taking life for granted. We ask that this time will be a wake-up moment for those careless ones and they might find their way to the cross and humble themselves that they too might find salvation in you. Bless our worship here this day and wherever your children are gathered. And may we not just serve you in times when we have challenges and problems, but may we be true, dedicated, and faithful to you all the way. For soon and very soon we'll see Jesus descending the azure skies and he will come for those who have been washed in his blood and cleansed from sin we ask that we'll be among the number who will hear from your lips well done good and faithful servant enter into eternal bliss hear us this day and remember again not only our brethren but your children everywhere because suffering is diffused throughout not only North America, but the old world as it were. You are the God of the universe. Be merciful unto us. And deliver us from evil, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, there's five things that God does not know. God does not know a sin he does not hate. God does not know a sinner he does not love. God does not know a heart he cannot change. God does not know a sinner, a sin that he cannot forgive, and he does not know a better time than now. Well, the Bible has a lot to say about having the right perspective on life. So many people today are living in the now, in the present, the world. And the questions that they're asking are questions, of course, that, that are important. And yet there is a lot more things that are important, questions that we need to be asking. Uh, in uh, Proverbs chapter 4 and verses 5 and 7, it says this, Get wisdom, get understanding. Forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Get understanding. Well, the, what, what is wisdom really? You know, we, we ask ourselves, well, what, what, what is really wisdom? Well, the dictionary defines wisdom this way. It is the quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment the quality of being wise. How, how often do you hear uh, people say, well, she's a wise woman, or he's a wise man, right? <laughs> I don't know if anybody's ever said that about me. <laughs> but, you know, I hope they can say, uh, you know, that uh, I, I am, I'm, a, I'm a person who loves the Lord. And... Um, Hopefully, I have some good common sense to go along with that. There was a boy who uh, wanted to be a preacher. He was out uh, on the farm, and he was hoeing potatoes. That was his job, all day long, hoeing those potatoes. And he thought to himself, there has to be an easier way of life here than hoeing these potatoes. And he thought to himself, I think I'll become a preacher. You know, and so at the end of the day, he went home, and uh, he went in, and he was really excited about it, and he told his grandfather... Grandpa, guess what? Grandpa says, well, what? What, son? What, what's going on? He says, I decided to be a preacher. Well, that's good, son. He said, now, to be a preacher, you've got to have learning, and you've got to um, not only learning, you've got, to be, you've got to have the grace of God. And uh, he said, well, he said, and you also have to have common sense. Yeah. He said, now, you can get learning by studying, and you can get the grace of God through prayer. But he said, son, if you don't have common sense, then neither man nor God can use you as a preacher. So that, that's the way that ended, right? You have to have good common sense. You have to have good judgment, really. And so that all comes really through experience. And we think about wisdom and what is wisdom. God wants us to be wise. That comes through experience. That comes through living. Um, and uh, going through uh, different kinds of uh, circumstances, uh, hardships, etc., uh, in life that you have to deal with. And uh, you make uh, bad decisions sometimes, right? Well, the next time uh, a similar situation comes up, you don't make that same decision, do you? Well, that's being wise, isn't it? You've learned something. And that's what life teaches us, to become wiser. I've often thought, you know, boy, I could be a better parent if I could go back in time now, you know, knowing what I know now you know, and raise my kids, you know, or I could even be a better preacher. Actually, really, I think I could be a better, much better preacher if I could go back in time knowing what I know now. Uh, but that's an impossibility. Can't do that. But we have a future to look forward to by the grace of God. There was an old man, you know, sitting on a park bench. 
And he uh, had a cane, and he had both hands on that cane, you know, with his chin down on that uh, on the cane there, and he was looking around, and here comes this young teenager bouncing along, you know, and this young fellow, you know, was just uh, really um, just a happy-go-lucky guy, you know. I mean, he had something to be excited about, and the, the man, the old man struck up a conversation with his son, said, what are you happy about? He said, well, I'm, I'm getting ready to graduate from high school. And the old man said, well, that's great. He says, what's your plans after you graduate? Well, I'm going to go to college. Well, that's great, too. What's your plans after that? He said, well, you know, I'm going to take business, and I'm going to become a businessman, and I'm going to open up all kinds of businesses all over the United States and all over the world. I, I actually, I, I want to become the, the wealthiest man, the richest man in the world. Well, that's all good, but uh, what then? What, what's your plans then? He said, well, he said, I think I'm going to get married and I'm going to have a family. Well, that's good. Then what, what's going to happen then? Well, I'm going to, uh, after that, he says, um, I think uh, I'll probably have grandchildren. He said, well, that's good too, but you're getting older. He said, then what then? He said, well, I think I'll just sit back and kind of retire and enjoy life. He said, but, you know, after, after that, what, what's next? And he thought, what do you mean, what's next? He said, well, what's going to happen when you get old and, you know, what happens to us? He said, well, I guess I'll die. He said, well, uh, what's your plans after that? <laughs> he said, well, you know, a big blank look comes over the teenager's eyes, a face, and he didn't know how to answer that one. How? What, you, what are you talking about? Well, see, that's the, that is the position of so many people today. They are living in the now you know, and they're not really thinking about the future. If you, you think about the, the, the greatest question that a person can ask is, what in the world uh, am I going to do with my life? Well, actually, if you take that great question, the greatest question that you can ask, and uh, conceptualize it into three connected questions. And the first one would be, where did I come from? Where am I? What am I doing here? And then where am I going after I die? What's going to happen? Well, a lot of people don't believe that there's anything after death. They don't believe that, 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 that this life is it. That's all there is. There's no more. And, um, of course, uh, we know that not to be true. And there are some Christians, actually, who think, well, you know, I think we really did come through a process of evolution. And so they want to harmonize science, that is, science, you know, the theory of evolution, with creation. And um, uh, actually, what, what, what one does when you do that, you place science above Scripture. You're using science as, your, uh, as the truth, and then you want to go to the story of creation and the fall of man, and you want to some way try to harmonize that with the theory of evolution. And it all becomes ridiculous. I'm going to believe what God says because I know that to be the truth. Well, if we look at our scripture reading, uh, Luke chapter 12, Luke and the 12th chapter, and beginning with verse 16. And this is the parable of, of uh, a man, Jesus says, uh, he spake a parable unto them, saying, verse 16, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat and drink and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So, he is, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Well, here this man is. He has everything. He has wealth, and I, you know, he could have been a good man, according to his neighbors, his friends, you know. I mean, they could have looked up to him, and maybe he, he even uh, helped them out when uh, they needed help. But still, Jesus said he was a fool. Here he is. He thinks, well, I've got all this, uh, all of these, the grain and everything, and I, I don't have room to store all of it. My boy, what a blessing it is. You know, back then, 
People really thought that God's blessing was on them when things like this happened. But Jesus makes it plain that the rain falls on the just and on the unjust, that God blesses both the wicked and the righteous. Well, here this man thought, you know, they, they thought back then, well, if you're rich, you know, God's, God's blessing is upon you and you're in. You're really in, the, in heaven, actually. I mean, you're going to go right there. Look at your, the way God has blessed you. But he failed to understand. And he thought to himself, what I'm going to do, I'm going to tear down those barns. I like the location where those barns are at, but they're just not big enough. I'm a, I know they're good barns. I know they are, but I'm going to tear them all down. I'm going to build some big ones. I'm going to start on that tomorrow. I'm going to have my, um, my workers to start on that immediately tomorrow. And so that's what he planned to do. He was going to tear them down. Well, what happens? And he thought with himself, well, that's because uh, there's no room. I'm going to tear them all down. Okay, and verse 19, and I will say to my soul, so thou hast much goods and laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Well, I'm going to have fun. I'm going to have, I'm going to enjoy life. I'm going to travel. I'm going to see things. I'm going to do all of these things. I have all these plans. I'm just going to have party after party. I'm going to have fun. But... God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then those shall those things be which thou hast provided. Where, whose are they going to be? Who's, who, who's going to get them? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. In other words, we can have accumulate all the wealth in the world, but what good does it do us if we lose our soul? Well, what does God how does he God count success, you know? Well, he counts success. He's measured upon our relationship with him. Amen. Do we really love him? Yeah. Do we have a connection with God? That's the question. Do we have a strong connection with him? That's the greatest question. Where did I come from? What's my purpose here and where am I going? Jesus gives the answer, doesn't he? Jesus gives the answers. The answers all are in Jesus Christ. He told us, listen, you can be poor and this world's good, but you can be rich toward God. You may be living in a third world country and you may have be one room. Or your whole family's living in one room, a dirt floor. But he says you can be still rich toward God. And that's what really counts. That's what really counts. Listen, all of those beautiful promises of mansions and golden streets, the new Jerusalem and all that really does mean something to people who have to live this way. It doesn't mean that much to us because we have everything. Well, some people may be listening that don't have everything. I don't feel that I have everything. But really, I don't really consider material things, possessions of really any great value at all. I've often said, you know, by God's grace, I could just leave them all behind and count them as nothing. If God called me to do so, I could do that because I am rich in the things of God. I am rich in the things of God. So when the rich man dies, who Jesus says is the fool, and then the poor man dies, and he is rich in the things of God, who is really the wise person? Who is really the rich person? It is the one who has no material possessions, who has no big bank account, but he's rich, she is rich towards the things of God. That is everything. Well, you take riches, there's nothing wrong with riches, there's nothing wrong with wealth, it's what we do with it. Abraham was a very wealthy man, but he indeed was a friend of God. God says he's my friend because he was rich in the things of God. And he looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. You see, he could see beyond. He could see the most important thing. He had already answered for himself the important question. Where did I come from? God created me. What am I doing here? I am to be about his business. I am to represent him. I am his ambassador on this planet. I am to help people to understand the plan of salvation. I am to help them to understand about Jesus Christ who loved them so much, who came and lived and died for them, the son of the living God, who died and was resurrected and is alive and sits on the right hand of God, and he is coming again to take us home. That is the promise, isn't it? That's eternal life. That's being rich towards the things of God. So... 
I feel very, very wealthy in the things of God. But there's so many people, unbelieving people, who don't even think about eternity. Their thoughts are in other places. They, they do not choose to believe what God says. That's very unfortunate. If you look at Acts, Acts and the 17th chapter, the book of Acts and 17th chapter and verse 18. For in him we live and move and have our being, the apostle Paul says. In him we live and move and have our being. In other words, every heartbeat that I have, that's God. He is at work in me. It's his power that keeps me alive. Every breath, that's God. He gives me that life, the ability to breathe. I don't have to think about those things. I don't have to think and concentrate. I've got to keep my heart beating. God takes care of that. He programs our brain so that that's done automatically. And the same with breathing. We don't have to think and concentrate. Well, I've got to take another breath or I'm going to die. We don't have to do that. God has programmed, programmed us and uh, programmed our brain so that it does it automatically. But it is in God that we live and move and have our being. That is so very, very important. That's what I believe. I believe what the Bible says. God invites us to consider life in his, on, on his terms and how he values success. The world views success in terms of money and of um, uh, possessions. When we think of wealth and we think of the wealthiest men on the planet today, who do you think of? Well, there's Bill Gates. How much is he worth? $106 billion. Warren Buffett, how much is he worth? $80.8 billion. Jeff Bezos is the richest, $114 billion. I can't comprehend, I can't comprehend that kind of money, can you? I can't. Boy, could you ever think, it, what if you had to count, how long would it take you to count a billion, two billion, three billion, a hundred billion? It's beyond my comprehension, really. I can't understand that. But did you know that there was a man who was wealthier than they were? He died in 1937. His name was John D. Rockefeller. And if you take what he was worth then in today's money, he would be worth $400, and eighteen billion billion. It's a lot of money, isn't it? Four, think of that, $418 billion. That's what he, in today's money, that's what he was worth, 1937. So, a lot of money, a lot of money. I, I don't know about these people. I don't know their spiritual experiences. I, I would certainly hope and pray that they will be saved, that they'll get everything right. I don't know. That's up to God. He judges. I am not to judge. If God left, up, left it up to me to judge people, who was going to be saved and who was going to be lost, heaven would be just like it is here, you know, because I would have sinners and I'd have people who, who weren't, who loved God, and I had people who claimed to love God but didn't love God because I can't read the heart. God can read the heart. But we need to pray for people. We need to pray for people that they indeed will come to a knowledge and understanding of what really true success in the eyes of God is. Well, Mark chapter 8. What shall it profit a man? Mark, oh, I tell you, uh, these verses are really very powerful. In Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, Jesus says? What's it going to profit him if he gains the whole world? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Those are really very, very important questions, and they are deep. And we need to contemplate that. We need to think about them. We need to meditate on this. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Do you know, many people, are, they sell out very cheap. You know that? Very cheap. May they think about pleasure, having fun, one party after another. Well, as I was young, I used to think about the same thing. But it's just one big vacuum, you know. And I've told the story about sitting in a nightclub in Cincinnati, you know, and how uh, the Holy Spirit was with me, you know. And he said very clearly, you know, not in a verbal voice, but the thought was so strong in my mind, 
is this all there is? Is this all you're going to get? Is this really fulfilling? Is this really filling the vacuum in your life? And I decided right then and there, there has to be something else. That's a lot better. But a lot of people sell out very cheap. And that's what they sell out for. It can be drugs. It can be, you know, the good time of the party. It can be sports, you know, get so captivated with sports. And uh, I, I am amazed when it comes to sports and how people are, uh, they know everything. They know, I mean, they're very smart people. They have all of this knowledge, I mean, uh, of baseball players uh, way back, you know, and they could tell you all about them and, and uh, basketball and football and, and uh, soccer and uh, hockey and all of those sports, you know. I mean, they, they, they're so knowledgeable about those things. And when it comes to NASCAR and, you know, <laughs> racing, they know all of the statistics and I am just amazed and I think to myself, boy, that kind of a mind, if it could only be, you know, devoted to the things of God, look what that person could do. Look what that person could do. They could, indeed, God could use that person, those kinds of people, you know, because they are so smart and they could learn so many things in regard to the things of God. God desires us to consider the destiny, our destiny, as he uh, would have us to look at it that way. Eternal life with him. That's what it's all about. Dear people, you can't really love God unless you know him. I have made that statement so many times. You, can't, you cannot love God unless you know him. And that's what Jesus appeals to. Know God. That's it. That's eternal life, to know God. Because you will get to love him. You will love him so much. He sent his son to us. Is eternal life worth exchanging for what this world has to offer? You know, that's what the devil offers us. He says, listen, I'll give you a good time. I really would. I, I mean, I really can, and I, I'll do that for you. I'll, I'll give you a really good time. There's all kinds of pleasures out there, all kinds of things that you can do and enjoy yourself. But at the end, it's going to be eternal death. That's what, how the devil's going to end up. All of the evil angels, they're among the walking dead. Their death sentence has already been passed. They will die for eternity. And they were, they're trying to get all they can to join them. I don't want to join them, do you? I want, I want to be rich in the things of God and not in the things of this world. In 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Think of this. This is, this is altruistic love, the love of God. It's, it's, there is no selfishness in the love of God. He's always thinking about about his creation. He is always thinking about you. Always. And here Jesus leaves the riches of heaven, if we want to call it that, all of the riches of heaven, all of the glory of heaven. And he comes here as a little baby born in a manger, in a barn, okay? In a barn. And he is raised in the town of Nazareth, which was indeed like Sodom and Gomorrah. And the, the saying was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? But that's where God placed him, in the midst of great sinners. Think of that. I, you know, we don't have the record of, of Jesus, you know, uh, we, the, the, in between the birth, you know, and when he was 12, just a little bit. But in between, we don't know. But think of this. The Son of God is in Nazareth, and he is ministering all this time to people. He was doing things for them. I believe Jesus was going without food to help these people. He would give up his meal and feed these people. He was always helping, always helping, always doing. He was always talking about the riches of the kingdom of God. And I think there's going to be a lot of people who's going to be saved out of Nazareth 
because Jesus was there. You see, God just, he didn't think about it that much. He just made his plans, and this is why it's going to be. And Jesus came to this planet. And I've often called this planet the graveyard of the universe. This is where death reigns. This is our great enemy. It's the enemy of God. This is the graveyard of the universe, and Jesus comes to the graveyard of the universe, and he brings life with him. And he tells us, listen, consider this. I have come that you might have life eternal. If you will come to me, I will give you life everlasting. Because I live, you will also live. Lo, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. Listen, God says, I love you. No question about it. I like this story in Luke chapter 18. I love this story. This is a story about the um, Bartimaeus, the blind man. Bartimaeus, you know, uh, he was really looked down upon because, you know, at that time, the people actually, and the, the religious leaders of that time thought, well, if you are, have a, some kind of a disease, you're blind, or that, that means the curse of God is upon you. You're some kind of a sin that you've committed or something has happened. You know, the God's displeasure is upon you. And that's why you have this disease. That's why you have this blindness, Bartimaeus. And that's what he thought. That's what he was taught. That's what he believed. But then he heard about Jesus Christ some way or another. He heard about Jesus Christ. He heard about him, that some believed that he was the Messiah. <clears throat> and some thought that indeed, and said that he had healed people of blindness, of disease, of leprosy even. Bartimaeus, that day they helped him out by the roadside where he sat, outside of Jericho there, and he was... They're begging people, begging for money, you know. I mean, that's the only way he had to live. He, the only way he could buy food. And there he was. They set him down. And then he heard a crowd that was coming. And he thought, boy, some, somebody of importance is coming. Maybe it's a, a government dignitary. Uh, maybe it's a prince, you know, that's coming. Uh, somebody has really a great importance because of all of this noise. There's a great multitude coming down the road. I can't wait. And then somebody said that it was Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, he asked, well, who is coming? Well, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And I'm telling you, hope came alive in his heart. Jesus, Jesus is passing by me, really. And when he just cried out, Jesus of Nazareth, have mercy on me. And it says that they which went before rebuked him that he should hold his feet. It's peace. Be quiet, you know. Jesus has cut time for you. Just be quiet. Don't, don't you know, just, just keep your mouth shut. But as that multitude grew closer and closer and closer, he knew that Jesus was right there. And he cried out as loud as he could, Jesus, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped. And he turned. And he said, bring that man to me. And they brought him here. And he said, what thou, thou should, should I do to you? I mean, what, what, what do you want? And he said, oh, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And he said, receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Amen. And that man got up. A man who was blind, he could see again. And he followed Jesus, praising God, thanking God. This man was a converted man. This man gave his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus is indeed passing by many lives today, bringing them to that place. And the only place where they must make a decision, it's either going to be life or it's going to be death. What will they choose? And Jesus made it very, very plain. In a very sorrowful way, he said, and the majority will choose death. Only a minority will choose life eternal. That is sad, isn't it? So I'm telling you, it's worth everything. Whatever tragedy we have to face in life, 
whatever terrible times that we have to face in life, like this terrible virus that we have to face. And friends have died, loved ones have died because of this. You know, we can go through it. God says, I will take you through this. We, I will take you through it. Don't be afraid. But Jesus is passing by so many lives today. And they are saying, no, not yet. Maybe a more convenient time. It's not really convenient for me. But I'm telling you, God does not know a sin. He does not hate and he does not know a sinner he does not love. He does not know a heart he cannot change. He does not know a sin he cannot forgive. And he does not know a better time than now. Heavenly Father, indeed, we are so thankful and grateful to you for 
the great plan of salvation. We're so thankful for Jesus who came and who left heaven and all the riches of heaven. And he became poor for our sake to help us to know that you love everyone wherever they might be in life, no matter how poor they are, no matter what kind of a sinner they've been, that you love them and that you have come to save us. Father, we're so thankful for, the, for that, that you have uh, indeed made that great plan of salvation possible, eternal life with you through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now, Father, we pray that you will bless each of us and may we continue, Lord, to behold all of the beauty of Jesus Christ. And may as we, as we behold, may those beautiful characteristics that we see in his life become a part of our own. May we reflect the beauty of Jesus in our own lives, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Thank you for joining the North Lake Seventh-day Adventist online church service. For more information, you may visit www.northlakesda.com. That's northlakesda.com. 